In the summer of 2010, a little boy in Oregon trudged into his elementary school, toting his science fair project, an oversized poster board covered in photos he had cut out of colorful tree frogs. He posed proudly in front of his project, smiling broadly. His oversized glasses perched slightly lopsided on his small face as his stepmother snapped a photo that she later posted to her Facebook page. At that time, no one knew that in a chilling twist, this image would be the last photo ever taken of seven-year-old Kyron Horman. Only one adult at the school, the PTA president, could say for sure they saw Kyron that day and she saw him next to his poster with Terry at the science fair. After that photo, no adult, no teacher, no aide, no secretary, no security guard, no janitor could say for sure that they saw Kyron that day. When the morning bell rang and the children settled into their desk and school began, Kyron was marked absent. When the bus stopped near his house, dropping off the neighborhood children, he didn't get off. And when his parents called the school, they were told he was never there. The last person to see Kyron Horman in the flesh that day was the woman who later became the prime suspect in his disappearance. The prime suspect in the eyes of Kyron's parents, and they claim also in the eyes of the police. Kyron's stepmother, Terry, claimed she drove Kyron to school that morning went inside with him to drop off his project at the science fair. She says she snapped the now infamous final photo of him, waved goodbye, and then watched him run down the hall towards his classroom with all the other children. But in that small, incredibly tiny window of time, Kyron vanished into thin air. It was like he simply ceased to exist. Whenever the news covers a story about a missing person, you'll often hear the anchors say, they vanished in the thin air, or the trail went cold. But most times, that's not completely true. Investigators can usually dig up some kind of final clue. Someone saw them leaving a bar with someone else. A surveillance video showed someone getting into an unknown car. A credit card was used at a random gas station. Or investigators find a cell phone ping off a tower. But in Kyron's case, he truly seemed to have vanished into thin air. Without a single clue, without a single trace. And despite a lot of movement in the investigations and chilling accusations, the case went ice cold. Leaving Kyron's disappearance is one of the most mysterious, unsolved cases of the past decade. Now think about it for a second. If an adult decides to go missing, they have the means, they have the wherewithal. They may have cash, they may have credit cards, they can get on a bus, they can hitchhike, they can walk along the road and not seem out of place because they're adults. But how about a 10-year-old bespeckled little boy? If you see a 10-year-old little boy hitchhiking along the road, everybody notices. If a 10-year-old little boy shows up alone at a bus station or anywhere else, people notice an unattended child. It's very difficult for a child to go completely off the grid and find a way to stay gone and survive. They have no money, they have no means. And of course, that always spells great concern for loved ones because that means they probably didn't run away. Now, Kyron's biological parents, Desiree and Kane Horman, have long believed they know what happened to their son and they point to the unthinkable that his stepmother, a woman who was supposed to protect this innocent little boy like a second mother, had secretly hated him, blamed him for her own troubles, wanted him gone, and made it happen. But that stepmother, Terry, maintains her innocence, and police have never charged her, or anyone else for that matter, with a crime. So what happened to that innocent, smiling little boy in the glasses that day? Did he vanish into thin air? 
and if so, how? You're listening to Into Thin Air, The Mysterious Disappearance of Kyron Horman. Green Chef is the first USDA-certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm-fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant-worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo-friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60mystery and use code 60mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. The relationship between the mother, Desiree Young, and the father, Cain Horman, was complicated to say the least. They had long been separated at the time of Kyron's disappearance as their divorce had been finalized before Kyron was even born. Kyron didn't grow up in a traditional home with a white picket fence, but he did have a mother, a father, and a stepmother, as well as a new baby half-sister named Kiara. Kyron's mother, Desiree, was originally from Medford, Oregon, about four hours away from Portland. She met Kane Horman, a promising computer engineer, and at first the two seemed like a match made in heaven. But when Desiree fell pregnant with Chiron, their relationship turned sour. They divorced, citing irreconcilable differences before Chiron was ever born. By the time he came into the world, he already had two separate families. One with his mother and her son, and another with his father and his new girlfriend, Terry Moulton. This is important because Terry... The woman Kyron's parents later accused of not just hurting him, but killing him, had been in Kyron's life since he was a newborn. This wasn't just some stepmom who came into the picture with a man who had an older child. She came into his life when he was a baby. And she didn't just know him since he was an infant. After his mother Desiree fell ill with severe kidney failure, Cain and Terry took on full custody while Desiree received life-saving treatment. Desiree's kidney failure was treatable, but the road to recovery was going to be expensive and it forced Desiree to make some difficult choices. One of them was to leave her youngest son, Chiron, with his father and his new girlfriend, Terry. She did this so she could travel to Canada to get the treatment she desperately needed. Desiree gave full custody to Cain. With a stressful job, becoming a sole parent and guardian wasn't something he was totally prepared for. But this was done at Desiree's request. She was not well, and she had no idea what the future had in store for her. Cain had no idea if Desiree was going to make a full recovery. He didn't know what the future held either. All he knew was that he had a two-year-old, and he needed to take care of him. For Cain, there was no ifs, ands, or buts. As a father, he knew what needed to be done, but he didn't raise Chiron alone. He had some help from this girlfriend, Terry Moulton. Cain's relationship with Terry had somewhat of a scandalous start because Cain had met Terry while he was still married to Desiree. I was seven months pregnant before it was confirmed that Cain was having an affair. At that time, Terry was one of the women that he was seeing. The night Kyron went missing, I said, Kane, a perfect stranger did not walk into the school and take my son. I know that you guys are having marital problems. I know what you're doing because I've seen it. And then that was when he finally apologized to me for having an affair on me seven and a half years prior. Kyron was missing. That's what it took to break him. 
When Terry entered Kane's life, Kane was dealing with a relationship that was definitely crumbling. He was also starting a new job and had a baby on the way. His friendship with Terry was a relief from the struggles he was going through. After Kane's divorce, he pursued a romantic relationship with Terry full force. When Kane first took full custody of Kyron, he knew he couldn't raise the child by himself, what with him at work most of the day. At this time, he and Terry had been dating for almost two years. Things were going so well that Kane had asked Terry to officially move into his Portland home to help take care of Kyron. Terry, just a girlfriend at the time, well, she was reluctant, but she did agree. So by 2004, Terry, along with Kane, began raising Kyron full-time as their own. He was just two years old. And even though many people say Terry was a loving caregiver, it wasn't easy for Terry to step into those shoes. Kane had a busy and demanding job Terry, who had been a substitute teacher and had obtained her master's degree with the hope of becoming the superintendent of a school district, was forced into the role of mom. A role that maybe she wasn't ready for, a role that maybe she came to resent. Because Terry was the last adult to see Kyron before he vanished, it immediately put her under a shadow of suspicion. A lot of questions needed to be answered, and Kyron's parents didn't feel like her answers were adding up. According to Desiree's testimony, Terry would frequently ask her to pick up Kyron under the pretense that he should spend more time with his mother. But Desiree believed it was truly to get him out of her hair and out of her way. She did not believe for one minute that Terry was concerned about the relationship between Chiron and his mother. She believed getting him out of her space was totally self-serving. Desiree said Terry would sometimes even offer to drive Chiron all the way from Portland to Medford to drop him off to his mom. We're talking about a four-hour drive here. Was Terry just being helpful to a woman who had been through medical hell? Or... As Chiron's mom, Desiree, suspected, was Terry that desperate to dump the child in anyone else's hands but her own? Terry strongly urged Cain to return custody of Chiron back to Desiree, but Cain refused. He didn't think it would be a good idea, plus Desiree was still getting back on her feet. She had been seriously ill. And in addition to having to fight the medical condition and overcome the medical obstacles, she was having to fight her way back into her life. There had been a tremendous gap created by her dropping out of society to deal with this disorder. To now get back into the workforce and start raising a son as a single mother would just be so much to deal with, Cain thought it was a bad plan. But Terry wasn't the only one who wanted Kyron to go back to living with his mother. Kyron himself apparently missed his mom terribly. Terry says he would cry himself to sleep, often waking up Cain and Terry, crying for Desiree each and every night. His mom worried that something beyond just missing her was going on behind closed doors. She says she feared that maybe something was off between Kyron and his stepmother. Something was off. What did she mean by that? He was very upset. He was crying. There was something going on. She wouldn't tell me what specifically initiated the event, um, but that he was upset. He wanted to come home. He wanted to come and live with me. He didn't want to be there, and he wanted me to come and get him. Desiree had never worried about Kyron being cared for by Terry before. Terry was an aspiring educator, was known to be a nurturing and attentive mom who always put her son James and Kyron before herself. By the time Kyron was seven years old and a second grader at Skyline Elementary School, Terry had married Kane and was his legal stepmother. And she took a more hands-on approach, volunteering at school events. She was even the emergency contact should anything happen to Kyron As Chiron grew older, 
his relationship with Terry seemed to grow stronger. According to Adam Barber, a swim instructor, Terry would teach Kyron, James, and her two-year-old daughter, Kiara, how to swim. He says the relationship was so close and so natural that it wasn't until Kyron went missing that Adam found out that Kyron was her stepson. But was there something brewing behind closed doors? According to Desiree, as Kyron was getting older from 2005 to 2010, he would be a bit of a headache for Terry because he'd constantly cry, wet himself, and ask for his mother. Kane admitted that during the period when they first took in Kyron, Terry was noticeably drinking more alcohol and even doing it in front of the kids. We actively talked about alcohol in the home and we tried to restrict that. And we did take some conscious steps and it seemed like things got better. It was over several years and Terry had started increasing the levels of alcohol in the home. Oftentimes I would go downstairs and my daughter would be roaming around the house with her passed out on the couch. Was this an indication that Kyron's presence was causing her so much turmoil it was driving her to drink? In 2005, Terry was driving on the Interstate 5 highway, supposedly heading home with her 11-year-old son James in the back seat. Her car was spotted zigzagging at different speeds. Police pulled her over and determined Terry was intoxicated and driving with her young son sitting in the back seat. Her blood alcohol level was 0.15, almost double the legal limit. Now, at 0.15, you are 380 times more likely to be in a fatal crash than if you are sober. And the drinker has the appearance of being a, quote, sloppy drunk. At this point, most drinkers begin to feel incapacitated, and many social drinkers will pass out. Nausea begins to set in, and drinkers have a difficult time focusing on any object and often report double or impaired vision. So she wasn't just slightly intoxicated with her son in the back seat. She was substantially impaired with her son in the back seat. As the police officers handcuffed her and walked her to their vehicle, they read her the Miranda rights and charged her with a DUI and a charge for reckless child endangerment. And once they found her information on file, they called Kane and asked him to pick up his son while Terry awaited her arraignment. Now, Terry took responsibility for her actions and pled guilty to the DUI and reckless child endangerment charges. Because this was her first conviction, the judge gave her no jail time, but instead ordered her to take a diversion course. In other words, a rehabilitation program to help Terry's drinking. Now, I make a point of this because it suggests that something was going on that greatly impaired both her motivation and her judgment. Remember, we're talking about someone that had a bachelor's and master's degree in education, meaning that she had devoted her life to working with and building up the future of young people. And yet here she is with her own son, putting him in a situation where she is 380 times more likely to have a fatal car crash and presents to the police as a sloppy, impaired drunk. This is more than just a lapse in judgment. Kyron remained in her and Kane's care. And Terry continued to shoulder motherly responsibilities, like dropping Kyron at school and going to his science fair like she claimed she did on the morning of Friday, June 4th, 2010. His father said it wasn't unusual for Terry to take Kyron to school, and the morning began like any other. It was a normal morning. Nothing seemed out of place. We got ready together, and I went to work, and I saw him walking out to the car before I left and gave him a hug, told him I loved him. Normal interaction. Terry claims that around 7.30 in the morning, she took Kyron to school. He was excited to present his science project to students, staff, and parents, a project that he worked extremely hard on. By 8 o'clock, Terry claims she and Kyron arrived at Skyline Elementary and headed inside the school's gym where the science fair displays were being set up. 
By 8.15, PTA President Gina Zimmerman reports seeing Chiron standing next to his project. Terry took the last photo ever seen of Chiron. She claims they left the fair together and walked up the main staircase of the school, parting ways in front of the school's central office. It's now 9 a.m., and another student claims he saw Chiron by the south entrance of the school, the only potential witness to see Chiron outside of the science fair is a child. Terry insists she returned to her car and left the school premises believing her stepson was safely inside his classroom. Okay, but you were where when right you where, saw where, Right where it indicates that I am at, yes. Right here? Yes. And his classroom is down here? Yes. And so you're looking from here down here and you see him almost to his classroom door. Yes. That's the last time you saw him. Yes. You, you described it as he was toddling off to his classroom. Yes. So he's making his way to his classroom. Mm-hmm. And he was almost to the door. Right. And that's when you last saw him. Yes. That's the last time you laid eyes on him. He was almost in his classroom door. Correct. But inside the school, something is off. Something isn't right. One by one, a teacher looks at each of her students' desk and marks them either present or absent, row by row, seat by seat, until she arrives at Chiron's seat. It's empty. There's no one there, no backpack, no books, nothing. Chiron Horman is not present in this classroom, and the teacher marks him absent. Yet strangely, no one is alerted that he is missing until he doesn't get off the school bus later that day. I say strangely, Because if a child is absent, there is almost always a policy, particularly at an elementary school, for the office to check with the home, to see if the child is ill, make sure the child is at home, make sure they haven't gotten stuck somewhere between home and school. They always notify a parent if the child is not in the classroom. Yet on this day, no one is told And it is not known that the child is missing until he doesn't get off the bus until the middle of the afternoon. That's important because it means the child has now been missing for almost eight hours. On June 4th, 2010, there was a science fair at the school. Kyron was so extremely proud of what he was doing for the project. I was really upset that I couldn't be there because... I wasn't able to take the day off. In the afternoon, we went down to the bus stop to pick him up. Terry was there, my daughter was there. We all walked down together to the bus stop and the bus driver opened the doors and we asked her, you know, was Kyron on the bus? And she said no, and we were a little shocked. Investigators immediately questioned Terry about her whereabouts. She claimed that after leaving Kyron at school, she ran errands, first going to a Fred Meyer grocery store around seven miles away to buy medicine for her daughter who had an earache. She had a receipt showing she had bought something at 9.12 from the store. But they didn't have the medicine she needed, so she headed to a different Fred Meyer. Surveillance footage showed her in both stores. Then she claimed that between 10 and 11.40 a.m., she was driving on Portland's rural roads in her white truck in order to soothe her daughter Kira's alleged earache. Law enforcement says you tell them that you're driving around with your daughter because she has an earache and I'm you're... Tr- I, what I told them was, as I was trying to get her down for her 10 o'clock you're, nap... You're soothing her. Correct. With cars will put kids to sleep. Right. We, exactly what I'm we doing. We do know that. Yeah. So from 1010 to 1139, you're driving along a rural... Well, there's a lot rural up there, but you're yeah. driving along a road and, mm-hmm. and hoping to that she'll go to sleep. Your cell phone pinged uh, at the Savi Island the day of the disappearance. That's not true. And you say that because there's not a cell tower on Savi Island, to your knowledge, right? Right. Then the last time that someone knows can verify having seen you. Um, is 1010, so then from 1010 to 1139, you're driving with your daughter. And, and I, at right. that point, you're, you've, you've said to them and to us that your thinking was, okay, if she goes to sleep, 
then we go home and have the nap. If she's not asleep, then I'll go to the gym right. and work out. And I did the exact same thing the day before. Right. Okay. So she doesn't go to sleep. So you go to the gym and you put your daughter in the daycare area there. Right. And you work out. Mm-hmm. Was it a problem putting your daughter in the daycare if, if she wasn't feeling well and had an ear infection? Um, the day before, she was in there for about probably 15 minutes or so, and um, they called me to come get her. But um, on the 4th, she seemed all right, but I didn't, you're only supposed to have about an hour limit time to um, leave your kid in there. Uh-huh. But because she hadn't been feeling well as well, I only left her in there for about probably 45 minutes or so, went and got her, and then was just talking to some people, just general, as I do. Okay. But... That was for one hour and 40 minutes, where no one saw Terry, where she was unaccounted for, her only alibi, a sleeping toddler. Police would zero in on this time and were determined to pinpoint her exact movements. Where did she go? Who did she see? She wasn't a suspect, but as police discovered the answer to all these questions... Their public statements made it clear that they were looking harder and harder at Terry Horman. The next place where Terry can prove she went was at 11.40 a.m. She checked into a 24-hour fitness gym and left her daughter at the daycare there. She worked out for 40 minutes before heading home. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, does this make sense so far? Well, I'm sure as a parent, Many of us know that when we put our child in their car seat and drive around, the vibration of the car can certainly soothe them and put them to sleep. So there's some credibility in that statement. I think everyone would agree. And she certainly has evidence that she showed up where she said she did at 9.12 and a few minutes later at a second Fred Meyer. Surveillance video confirms that. But then... There's a missing hour and 40 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes that we now know her stepson, Kyron, is missing. And then she shows up at 24-hour fitness and leaves her daughter in daycare, the same daughter that she went to the store to pick up medicine for an ear infection. Does it make sense to take a child with an ear infection and put them in daycare while you work out. I know that question's in your mind, so I'm just saying it out loud. Does a mother take a child with an ear infection and leave them in daycare while they work out? If it was bad enough to need to go get medication, would it be bad enough to administer the medication and take her home and keep her still? I'll let you answer that in your own mind. By 1.21 p.m., she had logged on to her Facebook page, and like any proud parent would, she posted the last known picture of Chiron. Chiron's parents would later question, could this woman have been capable of harming her own stepson, and then posting a photo to Facebook to get police off her trail. It's something that Terry has always denied, and I will remind you, also something that she has never been charged with. She has never been charged with harming her own stepson. She's never been charged with any crime associated with the disappearance of Kyron Horman. Around 3.30 p.m., Kane, alongside Terry and Kiara, walked to the nearby bus stop to collect Kyron off the bus and take him home. As the bus approached the stop and the door slid open, a number of kids jump out, but not Kyron. Kane waits a few more seconds. Maybe the boy is sitting in the back and it's taking him a while to walk out. Or maybe he's lost his glasses and he's struggling to find them. Those could have been a few theories as to why Kyron didn't exit the bus. But the truth is, he never got out of the bus because he never got on the bus in the first place. It's now 3.46 p.m. Kane and Terry appear to be panicking. They get on the phone and immediately call the school's principal, hoping the bus driver is mistaken and Kyron is just simply stranded at school. Maybe he missed the bus. But when the principal checks with Kyron's teacher and she says he never showed up to class, all the fears come to fruition. In that moment, 
there is the experience of a nervous terror that no parent should ever have to experience. The question is, was it experienced by Cain and Terry or just by Cain? Once the principal confirms that the boy is missing, they immediately call the authorities, and by 4.33, an hour later, law enforcement arrives at both Skyline Elementary and the Horman household. Okay, based on the information given, this was indeed a missing persons case, and the police knew that time was the essence. In missing persons cases, especially when the missing person is a child, those first hours are critical. And in this case, eight hours had already come and gone. You always hear that the first 48 or first 72 hours are critical in missing person cases. Let me talk to you a little bit about the reason why. It's during these first 48 to 72 hours that evidence degrades. If there are fingerprints or some piece of evidence, whether it be a cup or a piece of clothing or a footprint is left, just environmentally, the evidence can degrade. It can be walked on. It can be swept up. It can disappear. And in those first two to three days, memories tend to fade. And people that were in the immediate vicinity tend to scatter. They go on about their life and they're harder to find because the radius around the crime scene gets larger and larger as people return to their lives. And statistically, we have seen that after 72 hours, tips and leads slow down dramatically. We also know that in child abductions, very few, very few child abductions are committed by strangers. We also know that if a child is going to be murdered, it can happen in the first two to three hours and certainly in the first several days. So as time passes, a child being in peril and the abductor not knowing what to do with the child or how to handle the child puts pressure and they make really desperate decisions. So keeping pressure off of the perpetrator and preserving leads, all of these come to bear and put pressure on law enforcement to try and crack the case as quickly as possible. Search teams began combing the school grounds at approximately 8.09 p.m., almost 12 hours after Kyron was last seen in the south entrance of Skyline Elementary. At this time, law enforcement's ticking clock had definitely shortened. Those first critical hours had come and gone. By 10.40 p.m., officers had searched every corner of Skyline School and the surrounding property. They had also searched the Hormans' home. They found nothing in either location. As searches continued over the next few days, the FBI and National Guard joined the effort. All of Kyron's fellow classmates and all of the staff at the school were questioned. Kane and Terry were at their home answering questions from investigators. Kane told them that he last saw Kyron in the morning right before he left the school. He told them that he then went to work and did not learn that his son was missing until he was at the bus stop that afternoon. But law enforcement were more interested in Terry. They knew the layout of the school. Terry claimed when she last saw Kyron, he was at the top of the staircase by the front office. From that staircase, his classroom was only 50 feet away. Just 50 feet. That is a very small space for a child to vanish into thin air. Kane had been at the school, too, and this detail did not make sense to him either. Let me look how far he's going. He's not going that far. Mm -hmm. And even if they did split right there, you're going to tell me that he got picked up by a stranger in about 50 feet and willingly walked out the door with someone that he didn't know. Absolutely not. Not a and chance. There was the fact to consider that Kyron could have wandered off by himself into the woods surrounding the school or somewhere outside that hallway where he could potentially have been snatched. But if you knew Kyron at all, if you knew his personality, 
If you knew his physical attributes, then you knew this was not the type of child to take off alone. In fact, his mother, Desiree, said, if anything, he was more attached to her than any other children his age and was scared and sometimes even panicked if he had to go anywhere alone. Kyron is very shy and reserved. He always sticks by my side when we're in stores because he has this fear of not being able to see me. Kyron can see about maybe three feet out, so maybe on the other side of this tree he might be able to see. I remember we were standing next to each other in the pharmacy, and I literally stepped forward a couple feet because she called me, and I hear him behind me starting to hyperventilate and panic because he can't see me. Because his eyesight was poor and Kyron couldn't see further than three feet without his glasses, it just didn't seem plausible that Kyron would have left the school alone. His mother believes there's no possible way he would get up and leave unless someone was with him, and that would have to be someone he knew. While Cain initially supported his wife, saying she was committed to finding Kyron, he did eventually begin to fear Terry was involved in his son's disappearance. But Desiree says she immediately had reason to question Terry. Not only had her son gone missing on her watch, but Terry and Kane never called her to tell her Kyron was missing. She says she didn't find out until more than an hour later when she got a call from the school. I received a phone call about 4.20 in the afternoon from the secretary. She said, I was asked to call you by law enforcement to notify you that Kyron is missing. And I didn't know what to do with that because why hadn't Kane called me? Why hadn't Terry called me? How was he missing? Because I had tons of emails confirming that he was there. And so I went to call Terry and I said to Terry, you went to the science fair. How is he missing? And that question is the one that has haunted both Desiree and Kane and everyone who followed this story for nine years. How? How is he missing? How did he go missing? There's only one answer that seemed to make any kind of sense to Desiree. And with a creeping horror, she began to fear that Terry might be hiding a dark and deadly secret. As the search for Kyron intensified, so did the public scrutiny of Terry. And something about Terry's claim that she last saw Kyron standing on those steps of the school's main staircase caught Desiree's attention and made her believe in that moment that Terry was lying. And when they pulled that thread, Desiree's trust in Terry's account, well, it really began to unravel. And as police dug further, one question burned in their minds. When Kyron didn't show up for school unexpectedly, why hadn't the school called Kyron's parents about his unplanned absence? And with this question, another hole appeared in Terry's account. A teacher claimed no one questioned Kyron's absence because Terry had told her that Kyron would not be there that day. That's right. A teacher claimed that no one reported Kyron's absence because his stepmother, Terry, had informed the school through this teacher that Kyron would be absent that day. So what does Terry have to say about this? Well, that's exactly where we're going to start on the next episode of Into Thin Air, The Mysterious Disappearance of Kyron Horman. I'm Dr. Phil. Thanks for listening. Thank you.